serve a God who's alive today, amen? And the scriptures encourage us that, that same light that rose, that raised Christ from the dead now lives within us. And that Christ said that we might have life and life to the fullest, overflowing. And so today, as we celebrate, as we worship him, I want to challenge us to just welcome in that new life. Will you do, do that with me as we pray? God, we love you. We thank you so much that we can call upon you and that you hear us, Lord, for you are alive, you are well, you are victorious, oh God. And so, Lord, we pray today that that life abundant would overflow in us and through us, oh Lord, in all that we do, oh God. Lord, we thank you and we worship you, Lord, for all you've done and all you, that you are. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Let's do that right where you're at. Lord, we worship you. I bless your name. Lord, you are good, and your love endures forever. You are a good God who gives good gifts to your children. Lord, you know how to take care of your own, Lord. 
Lord, we worship you. Lord, you are our peace. You are our strength. You are the glory and the lifter of our heads. We bless you, O God. Worthy are you, O Lord. Thank you, Lord, we worship you. I want to take a moment to pray just for the needs that we might have as a church body. If you're here and you're saying, I need God to do something. We just we talked about, we sang about knowing that God is good, that his love endures, that he knows where we're at, that he's brought forth victory and strength and healing. We believe in a God that moves and acts today. And if you're here and you'd say, I need God to do something in my life, if it's physical, raise your hand. If it's emotional, raise your hand. If it's mental or spiritual, whatever it may be, we have a God that has more than enough resources at hand to heal and move on behalf of his people. At home, I want you to do the same. Just would you can lift your hands up right now where you're at and say, that's me. I need God to do something. I'll raise my hand. I need God to touch my back this morning. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to ask you this. If you're comfortable doing this, I want you to just put your hand on the person next to you. At home, you can do this as well. Keep your hands up. We're going to pray for each other. It's important for us to know that in this season that we are not by ourselves, that we are still part of God's family. Amen? So, Father God, we lift up our hands before you. We're calling out to you. As we reach out to you, we know that you reached out to us. That in the name of Christ, Lord, we pray for healing in the name of Jesus. We pray for strength in the name of Jesus. We pray for your touch upon them, Lord. If it be provisional, if it just be just your relationship arms around them, God, to let them know that they are not alone. We pray that in the name of Jesus, that depression and despair and anxiety would be gone. Oh, Lord, you will keep him in perfect peace, him and her whose mind is stayed on you. So, Lord, we set our minds upon you. Let your perfect peace come. Lord, we thank you. Bless our brothers, bless our sisters, bless those that are in the cars listening, that are online listening, Lord, that right now we believe, God, that you are no respecter of distance and that you can still do a move in the miraculous, God. Have your way, we pray. We love you, Lord. And we entrust them now into your care. For we know that you're good and your love endures forever. So, Lord, once again, we pray. Be with us, Lord, as we worship you. Open our eyes that we may see you. Open our ears that we may hear you. Open up our hearts that we might receive all that you'd have for us this day. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. And the family of God said, amen. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. everyone. Welcome to Pastor Wade's Show and Tell. As I've been going every week, bringing forth a power tool up, today's power tool, as you can tell, is an air compressor. And most of my power tools are gifts. Most of them have been from my dad, but this one actually is from you. Believe it or not, a couple years ago, as part of Pastor Appreciation, I gave myself a gift, thank you very much, of buying an air compressor tool set. Because I needed to do some projects around the house. Thank you very much, Andrea. And so, (laughs) 
And it's amazing the wonderful things I've been able to do with my air compressor. We've been able to do, put flooring in at the house, you know. We've been able to repair our deck and do some projects around the house. I've been able to build numerous birdhouses with it. The, the scope and the variety of projects I've been able to do is pretty incredible. From the little small, small little, little ticky-tacky things, you know. It's so much nicer having a little Brad tool gun that puts the tools in and it's me hack my hand with a hammer every time I'm trying to put those little... You talk with me, half inch, little nail, half quarter inch, those are painful. Anyway, so it's been wonderful to see all that I've been able to do. Now, here's the thing with air compressors that I kind of find it interesting, and this might be kind of obvious, but I think it's worth noting. The same air doesn't pass through it for every project. It compresses the air, and each project, it, it's a little bit different. Sometimes it's a continuous pressure, like if I'm blowing air through, you know, cleaning my garage off with the air hose, right? You know, it's continuous. Sometimes it's loud and thunderous like a clap when it slams the nail through there, and I usually hear a little, oh, my, in the background because it's a little bit louder, you know. Okay, moving on. <laughs> but I have to confess, and, and all that goes on, and it's an incredible, powerful tool, and the, and the application of it is so broad in all the different ways you can use it. I also have a little bit of fear of this. There's that part of me, and what happens if I crank up the pressure too much? There's this part of me, like, what's the safety rating really? What happens if this thing explodes? Right? You probably never thought of that before. Now you're going to go home and look at your air compressor and go, oh, we need to get this out of our house. But, you know, there's that part of me, especially when I'm disconnecting a tool and I'm popping the air hose, it's always that loud, you know, I can't even do it as loud as it does, you know. It's loud, and it catches me off guard sometimes. And when we talk about spiritual gifts, sometimes they can be that way. Spiritual gifts can be very broad in their scope and in their application, they can be very various in the way that, various ways that they're employed. They can sometimes be very quiet, sometimes they're very loud. And there's always that risk that they're going to explode. Maybe you've been hurt by the shrapnel of an exploding spiritual gift. Well, today, and once again, I want to go through the spiritual gifts, God's gifts to the church, and how they can be practically applied in and through our lives. So if you're following along in your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read two portions from this chapter this morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, it says once again this. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Everybody say, for the common good. For the common good. It is God who empowers for the common good. Then jump with me just a verse down to verse 9 through 11. It says this to the verses we'll be talking about today. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another various kinds of tongues. And to another interpretation of tongues. And listen to this. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. We serve a God today who empowers his people. God can do it himself, but he chooses to empower us, his church, to minister to each other, but also in order for the common good that Christ would be made known. That is the purpose of the gifts today. So today we're going to hit on two of the biggies. So if you've been waiting for them, here we are. We're going to talk today about gifts of healing, working of miracles, and prophecy. And we're going to go through a lot. So I'm hoping you're ready to take notes. If you're following on the Church Center app, a lot of these notes will be in the Church Center app. And so you can follow up a little bit later. But for the sake of time and for understanding, I'm going to include at the beginning here gifts of healings and working of miracles together simultaneously, because a lot of their interplay is connected with each other, as well as their overlapping in their understanding and application. So let's talk a little bit about healing. You are probably familiar with the term healing. Healing in the Greek is EMA, and it simply means healing, cure, medicine, remedy. It's healing. There's not a lot of real, you know, uh, wonder in that moment. We, we can figure that out, but today... 
when we talk about healing, especially in the realm of faith, our purpose is to not so much the meaning, but the scope of the word. As people of faith, when we speak of healing, we refer to the complete work of Christ on Calvary, in which he made us whole physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Let me pause for a moment, because sometimes when we talk about healing, especially in the realm of faith, we only think physical healing. Christ came that we may be spiritually made whole. He also came that we may be mentally made whole and emotionally as well. If you want to go take it a step further, he also brought forth relational healing in that he restored the relationship between God and man. There is a huge scope and power when we speak of what Christ has done for us because of Calvary. So the scriptures that says in 1 Peter, by his wounds we are healed, are very true, very applicable, and actually very broad at the same time. This gift encompasses every aspect of who we are as individuals. And what we need to know when we talk about the word, this gift here, this gifts of healings, and then later on workings of miracles, it is both words are in the plural. This is important, okay? Both the gifts is in its various many ways multiplied, and healings is very much multiplied. It's not just one time or one agent, but in very ways and various applications. R.M. Briggs, noted scholar, defines the gift of healings as this, divine enablements to heal the sick in the aid of natural means and human skills. This is apart from us. This is not what you can do on your own. This is something that God does, but it's divine enablements. It's plural. E.R. Corsi says it this way. He takes it a step further by saying this. Every healing is a, spiritual, a special gift. There are no healers. I want to stop there for a second because that may bristle some of us. But when we talk about this, it is God giving the gift of healing and how that works in us and through us. Now, this pluralized understanding also applies when we talk about the workings of miracles. In the Greek, I like to say it, it's Energamata dunameon. And isn't that cool? Energamata dunameon. It means energized dynamite. Right? Just a simple way. I'm just breaking down. It's the lit fuse on dynamite. Isn't it cool? You know when the, the fuse is lit, something's going to go, right? That's when we talk about when we talk about workings of miracles. It's this active power of God on display, often interrupting the rules of the natural with the supernatural. When we talk about this character of God being able to interrupt the natural laws, I want to quote A.W. Tozer. It says this, God possesses what no other creature can, an incomprehensible plentitude of power, potency that is absolute. God set the rules, but it also is above the rules at the same time. He can interrupt at any time, at any moment, and do whatever he wants. And we need that, amen? Harold Horton puts it this way, a miracle, therefore, is a supernatural intervention in the ordinary course of nature, a temporary suspension of the accustomed order, an interruption of the system of nature as we know it. That's important. You think, Pastor, you're throwing a lot of big quotes out there. But it's important for us to understand that God can interrupt and do whatever he wants because he is God. He can do it. That applies both in the workings of miracles, because you can have the report of the doctor, you can have the report of the natural, which is true and accurate, but God can still oversee that and move in a supernatural way. God can do that in our lives. So just like healings, workings is, working of miracles is plural, that meaning that they're not in a constant state of being or position, but that they can be applied multiple times, manifested in multiple ways waves. When we talk about go, both gifts, I want you to catch this. If you're taking notes, this is important. The focus of these gifts is more on the source and the recipient than it is on the agents whom God uses. I want to say that again. The focus is more on the source and the recipient than it is on the agents whom God uses. Let's talk about Christmas for a moment. Right? When we think about Christmas, we get a gift, right? When you think about Christmas time, it's, you don't go around bragging saying, I gave gifts to people at Christmas time. It's kind of like assumed, like, yeah, I hope so. Where's mine? 
right? You all with me? We don't go walking around telling everybody, I'm a giver. I'm a giver. I give gifts. I'm a giver. But unfortunately, we, we take this mindset and we use it in the realm of spiritual gifts, saying that I'm a miracle worker or I'm a healer. No, the, the focus isn't on the agent whom God uses. The focus is on the source who's giving the gift and who is receiving the gift. That's the more important part. Now, before I move on, let me just talk a word about healing. I got to tell you, there's some things we don't understand and that we have to leave in the hands of God. There are some things that are quite simply a mystery. Personally, I will confess, I will testify, I have prayed for people, and I have seen them throw off their bandages. I have seen them get up and walk out of wheelchairs. I have seen miraculous healings take place. And others, I have long interceded for, and have not seen a healing. What do we do with that? The error, and I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself, but we'll come back to it. The error sometimes is that we look at the agent as the cause of the malfunction. We look at ourselves, well, maybe I didn't have enough faith. Maybe things didn't work out the way. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And we throw ourselves in that category. But once again, the focus is it on us. The gifts are for the common good, not for you. You all hear me? And so I, I want to read this long quote. It's by W.B. Godby. It helps bring a little bit of perspective, something that we have to continue to keep in mind. And I'll be honest with you, it's Pentecostals that struggle with this mindset the most. It's those that believe in the moving of the gifts that have a trouble when the things don't go the way that they think they should that struggle the most. But I hope this helps. In his commentary on the, on the book of Corinthians and Galatians, W.B. Godby says this, Of course, the body is not perfectly healed until this mortal puts on immortality. And we enter the glorified state either by translation or the resurrection. Therefore, all bodily healing in this life is but the earnest of the glorious, complete healing which is to come. Mortality itself being the very quintessence of disease, final and perfect. Perfect healing, utterly and eternally being eliminating it. Neither is our failure to get healed an argument against our spirituality as we are healed by the gift and saved by grace. It is our glorious privilege as a Christian duty to appreciate and utilize the gifts of healings in order that we may be a blessing to the suffering thousands on all sides. We need the gifts of healing. We need to pray for the gifts of healing. We prayed this morning for healings. Why? Because we have seen it, we have heard it, we have witnesses even in our own congregation of God doing healings. And we trust that he knows when and how it's applied in its various forms. I wish I could tell you this is the formula. I don't have the formula. I, I will say this, though. I do know the prayer. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, I believe you're able. And even if it doesn't come the way I think it should, I still will trust in you because I believe in a greater healing that's coming. I believe there's suitable example both in the present and through the Bible that God still moves miraculously in and through our lives. And, and there are numerous examples in the New Testament of God doing both healings and of working of miracles. But I wanted to find one that was kind of encapsulated both. And so I want you to follow with me to Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, we're following Paul on his journeys. He's going around and he's ministering to the crowds. Now, Paul's a finite being. Paul can't be everywhere right? So people are coming to him for prayer requests. They're calling into the church prayer office, you know, office to say, hey, Pastor Paul, can you pray for this need? And this is what we see in Acts 19.11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Here we have two things overlapping, Paul doing extraordinary miracles, a lot more that were implied in this passage beforehand. And that the fact that people who were unable to be there physically with Paul, they brought a token representing that person. Paul prayed or touched him, and they took it back. And in faith, that person had a miraculous healing take place. It's like the woman who had the issue of blood, and she pressed through, and with her faith, she laid hold of the garment of Jesus. Now, what healed her? Was it the garment, or was it Jesus? 
Jesus. That's the correct answer. It's the perfect Sunday school answer, right? In the same way, was it the handkerchief that healed them? Or was it faith in Christ that healed them? Faith in Christ, right? Now, here's the question I always what happened to those handkerchiefs afterwards? This is what I think what happened to a handkerchief after they used it. Because that's what handkerchiefs are made for. You think, well, no, pastor, they framed it and they put it on the wall. No, no, that handkerchief, they probably set up an altar to the handkerchief. Now, I'm joking, but sometimes we slip into that mental mindset. And we think, well, it's got, I got to get another handkerchief for Paul to pray for, right? Paul's in the pr- handkerchief praying business. That's not what it's about. It's about God using a very limited means because at that time they didn't have telephones. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have Zoom calling, right? The church was still in its infancy, and there is a way and means to get that word out personally, people, and this was one of those ways. So how do we see these gifts practically applied? Because we do want healing. We want to see working of miracles. So let me go back to a couple things, and you're going to hear a lot of repetition from our previous uh, a couple of guests we talked about, but the same applies here. First of all, this practical application is about workings of miracles and gifts of healing. It's not you, but who you know. You can't give what you don't have, one pastor once told me. If you don't know him, if you're not with him, don't expect to see things working around you the way they should be, right? Great example of this is going to be in Acts 19 again, uh, where the, I'm sorry, 21, where these, you have the seven sons of Sceva. They go to cast out a demon. And they say, we cast you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the demons reply, well, wait a second, we know Paul. And we know Jesus. But we have no clue who you are. And it says that the demon beat them bloody and naked and sent them out running through the town. It's not who you know. I mean, I'm sorry, it's not who you are. It's who you know. And I would just give you a little personal word of advice. And I'm just going to throw this out there. I personally would encourage you to never allow the titles healer or miracle worker be placed upon you. Don't even take them up. Just for the sake of your own pride and where people's eyes are looking, don't give the enemy a foothold that he doesn't need. Just as a word of advice, though, do what you want. You can get business cards printed up if you feel like you need to. All right. But along the lines, the second thing is this. Keep your heart pure and keep praying. This is a big one. This sounds so simple, right? It's easy. Come on, it's easy to become discouraged when things don't go the way you want and you don't see the immediate answer that you wanted. I've been there. I've, like I said, there's things I've been praying for miraculously. I still remember the day my daughter Sable, she fell as we, we were leaving Colorado and coming out to who knows where. We didn't know where we were going to stop next, but she jumped and she broke the tip of her elbow off. She jumped off, hit the, jumping on my bed without my permission. All right, just saying that out there, Sable. And she broke the tip of her elbow off. She had a cast on. You know what it was like trying to move in August with a, with how old was she, six or seven, something like that? Like? Four, okay. I got her birth date down, all right, that's all right. Four years old. She's got a cast on. It's hot. It's sweaty. It's itchy. She's miserable. We promised her that on the, on the move that we were going to stop at all these hotels and go swimming. She couldn't even do that. She was miserable, right? You know, we were miserable because health insurance was going away. Y'all with me, right? Come on, this is where it gets real. And I still remember, this is one of those moments where I remember we got, we moved to our apartment. We were waiting. We were in between churches. Had no, no, no provision, no financial. We are totally relying on God. And she gets the cast off. Dr. Angel was his name. Great name, by the way. And uh, takes the cast off and tells her, okay, whatever she does, she can't land on it. She can't fall on it. She's got to be careful for the next week, but she'll be okay. Our, you know, she continues to stretch it out. No sooner do we get home from the doctor's office. The kids go home. They run out back towards the tree, and Sable falls on her elbow. She comes in, and her arm is all swelled up. And there's a big knot right there. I tell you, I cried. I didn't know what else to do. I took her. She just wanted to take a nap. I said, all right, we'll take a nap. Put a call into the doctor. And I went in my room. And I cried. Like a baby. 
I said, God, I got nothing else. I got nothing else. I, got, I, ha, I have no, no insurance. I have no money. I have no job. I don't even know. It's my poor daughter, I don't know if she's even going to be able to straighten her arm out again. That's what the, the doctor said. If she fell on it, she could move the gro- It was on the growth plate. It would move up in her arm or whatever, one way or the other, and she might not be able to use her right arm fully. I began to pray like nothing else. God, do it. I can't do it. I got, I, folks, I'm telling you, I was emotionally spent. You want to talk about faith levels? It's at the bottom of the barrel. But it's not about me. It's not you. It's who you know. Two hours later, or maybe around that time, it gets a little fuzzy. I remember going in, and I'm just praying. My eyes are red. I'm praying. I come in to look at her, and all the swelling was gone. The bump was gone. It was miraculous. Never has had a problem with her arm since then. It was so miraculous, I even questioned, I was like, did you, did you really fall? Did you really hurt yourself? Because I just embarrassed myself for a lot. You know? and, but I laid it all down, and God was able to move. This same daughter, uh, it gets better. Say, say, well, you're watching, I love you. Um, <laughs> We were out in, in New England visiting my family. If you don't know, I have a deathly allergic uh, allergy to shrimp, Gloria. Um, <laughs> every potluck, Gloria makes a shrimp dish, in case you're wondering, okay? I have this, she's shaking her head. Yes, she does. I am allergic to it like I will see Jesus kind of stuff. We went to a Chinese restaurant, I, and, and I don't like Chinese food because it's deadly. And... Uh, because there's always shrimp somewhere. And we asked this lady, we asked the waitress over and over again, is there shrimp in the egg rolls, shrimp in the egg rolls, shrimp in the egg rolls? You all with me? Say shrimp in the egg rolls. Because there was shrimp in the egg rolls. So sure enough, I take a bite of sh- I had taken a bite, and I chewed it, I swallowed it, and as I pulled it away from my mouth, another piece of shrimp that was half bitten fell out on my plate. We were in a foreign country in a foreign land. It was called Maine. <laughs> and we're there, and I, once again... There's no medical coverage. I'm not in the comforts of my home. I got nowhere else to go. So being the great man of faith that I am, you know, I, I said, I need to get Benadryl. I need to just chug a whole bottle. I need to do something to get ready because I know, I know what happens when I have shrimp. There's a history. There's a track record. I know what's coming down the way in the natural. And my daughter, in the middle of this restaurant, because now the waitress, she's panicking. She's almost to the point of tears. My, my in-laws, they're yelling at her, calling for the manager, threatening lawsuits, all this crazy fun stuff. And I'm thinking, I don't care. I don't want to die. And all the people in the restaurant are all talking. Everybody's stopping everything. And my little daughter gets up in that moment. She says, everyone be quiet. We have to pray for my dad right now. <laughs> the whole place goes quiet. And she prays. So great man of faith that I am, once again, I stop at Walgreens. <laughs> right? I get myself some Benadryl. I know that the dosage, I get the super monster dose that I'm supposed, I'm supposed to take right off the bat. Of course, being the man of faith, I did not bring my EpiPen with me. I know, Tracy. I know. Um, and so, and I, I told Andrea this. I said, Andrea, I can't even stay awake because of the Benadryl in me. I said, I'm going to lay down and take a nap. I said, you've got to check on me to make sure I'm still breathing every five minutes. Because that's what happens. My mouth, my throat, everything closes up. I said, you've got to check on me to make sure I'm still breathing. I mean, I still get choked up thinking about it. I remember going to bed and, and going to sleep, and I had a vision from God. I know it sounds silly. You may not get it, but that's okay. I got it, and that's all I needed. And I remember God saying to me in my dream, he says, get up, you're healed. I've heard your daughter's prayers. I got, I woke up. Now, I don't know if you've ever taken a bottle of Benadryl before, but the, the, the effects last for a little while, right? I woke up. I didn't even have any drowsiness. There was nothing. All the tingling, all the swelling in my hand, everything was gone, completely, miraculously healed because someone said, we got to pray for my dad right now. I'm here to tell you God heals but I want to encourage you, you got to keep praying. And if things don't work out, if things don't appear the way, you keep praying. You're not called to heal. Hear this now. This is going to rub some of us the wrong way. You're called to pray for healing. 
God is the one that heals. Now, God says, raise the dead, heal the sick. But once again, that's you going out and speaking in faith and praying in faith. Amen? You're not the healer or the miracle worker. He is. But we do believe he moves, okay? And that leads me to the last part, is that we have to trust the end result is in God's hands. When it's all said and done, you're not responsible for their healing. I, I'm telling you this as a pastor. I have felt this over and over again. Because if it was me, I would have done something. I don't get it all the time. Sometimes there's factors I just don't understand. But I still go and I pray. There's times I prayed for people and I had nothing in the tank. And people came back later, you know, like, Pastor, we never want you to pray for us again. But there's times I prayed full faith, you know, like, yeah! boom, 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 you know, and God does the miraculous, and there's times I've done that, and nothing's happened. There's times when I've, someone's come up and bugged me, said, Pastor, 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 pray, pray, pray for me, pray for me. I'm like, okay, fine, God, heal them. I got to go, right? Ken's like, it's not that bad. I'm really, <laughs> I'm just, I'm being honest with you, right? And God heals them. They come back to me two or three days later. God did a miracle. I'm healed. Thank you so much, you mighty man of God. I'm like, it's, it's all him, because I wasn't really in it right? I want us, I'm, I'm making fun of it. I'm trying to help us out because there's this mindset that has to be broken, this stronghold that has to be broken that thinks that you've got to do it. You just got to pray. You just have to believe and trust in the living God who loves us, who gives good gifts to his children. We need these gifts today. These gifts are a testament of the healing work of Christ on Calvary, that he made us whole, that he did the miraculous in being raised from the dead. And that, that same power that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in you, the Apostle Paul says. So that's the faith by which we pray. We believe that God can do the miraculous. In the natural, we are doomed for destruction. But God, in his great mercy, ransomed us and gave us the gift of eternal life. That's miraculous, too. So I want to challenge you. Please don't go home. Please don't write an essay. Don't send me a text that pastors against healing. Because I just gave you two great examples, right? But I do believe we have to deal with some spiritual pride issues that can hinder our prayers. We trust in God who is good. So you thought those were easy, and now we're going to get the really good one. Let's talk about prophecy. Yeah, you notice that too. Yeah, right? What is prophecy? Prophecy is divinely inspired speech. Simple, right? In the Grecian context, it is the gift of interpreting the will of the gods. That's how it was used in Greek literature. Dennis Bennett helps us understand the gift of prophecy is manifested when believers speak the mind of God by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and not from their own thoughts. It is supernatural speech in a known language. Prophecy is not a private gift, but is always brought to a group of believers, although it may be for one or more individuals who are present. R.L. Brandt helps us understand it by saying this, when a believer is enabled to speak forth with an authority not his own unto edification, exhortation, or comfort of other believers, or the, to the conviction and the salvation of the unbeliever. There's a purpose within the gift of prophecy. Hear me on this one. When a believer is enabled to speak with the authority of God for the edification, the exhortation, and for the comfort of believers, or for the conviction and the salvation of the unbeliever, that is the gift of prophecy in action. When we talk about the gift of prophecy, we often use, break it down to two simple terms. It is foretelling and foretelling. Once again, foretelling is the exhortation. This is what is going on right now. This is what's happening in your life. This is what God wants to speak to you in this moment. And then there's foretelling saying this is what's coming down the road. Once again, this is divinely inspired. This is not human intuition. This is God speaking through his people. Okay? The purpose of the gift of prophecy is redemptive. Hear me on this one. It is not accusatory. It is not judgmental, and it is not shaming. That is not how God works. God brings conviction, true, but conviction towards redemption. Are you hearing me? 1 Corinthians 14, 3 puts it this way. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding, 
their encouragement, and their consolation. Leave that up there just for a second, if you would, Haley. When you use the gift of prophecy, you are speaking for to upbuild, that is to strengthen, to encourage, to bolster their faith, and to console them, to encourage them where they're at right now to move forward. Are you tracking with me? One example we see, and it's a really great example, is found in Acts chapter 20. Paul is traveling to city after city, and he comes to meet with the church leaders, and we see this in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 23. It says this, he speaks to the, the leadership, and now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Now, think of this. Paul's going from city to city, and everywhere he goes, the Holy Spirit's testifying. How's the Holy Spirit testifying to him? Through people in the church, using the word of prophecy, telling him this is what's coming this way. The Holy Spirit is directing him to Jerusalem. He's constrained. He's compelled by the Spirit to go in this direction. He doesn't know what's going to happen except for the fact that imprisonment and affliction awaits him. Now, you might think, well, pastor, that's judgmental right there. No, it's actually a consolation. Because if you think about it, Paul's going to get imprisoned. He's going to get tortured. He's going to struggle with the thought of, why am I here? And he needs to know the fact that God has a plan even in the midst of this. Sometimes you're going through a real difficult moment, a difficult journey, and you need somebody to know, somebody to say, God's with you in this moment. God is there. For me personally... At this church, a number of years ago, we had a very difficult situation that we had to walk through with some of the leadership in the church. It was a very difficult, difficult, probably the hardest year of ministry for me. And I even was questioning, God, what did I do wrong? How did I, how did, why did I allow this to happen? What, and I was looking at me. And I said, God, you know what? At this point, if this is what you want, I don't want to cause any more firm, further harm to this church. I will resign and move on. Many of you know the incident that I'm referring to. And I remember saying, God, this is where I'm at. I'm trying to do what's best for your church. I don't want to see your church sullied, dragged through the mud. I'll do what I need to do. That night, without having putting it on Facebook, without having anything else, I had five different people call me up from around the world, literally, that said this, I was praying for you. I was praying, one in particular said, I was praying and God interrupted my thoughts with you and told me to tell you this, that God has appointed you for this time. Hold steady. Four other people texted, either texted, called, or emailed me, said, I don't know what you're going through in your life right now. I don't know what's going on, but God told me to tell you this word. He's appointed you for this. Four, five times, five witnesses, five people that didn't know each other. You all with me? And I said, okay, I'm hearing you now, God. Right? It was a hard moment. But I was able to go through that difficult moment, that difficult season with us together as a church, because I knew that God was going to walk with me through the valley. Paul needed to know that when in, what lays ahead of him wasn't just something that he had done wrong himself, but that, that God was going to lead him through the process. Amen? I'll go give you another personal example. Anybody remember 2020? Just throw that out there. Yeah. End of 2019, October. You know that every, uh, you know my, my path right now, every, my, my tradition. Every October, we stop, we pray, we begin to intercede for the next year. What do you want to do in the next year? What do we need to be prepared to do in the next year? Actually, it started in September for me that last year. And every time I came back, God said this. He gave me two words. He said, hard reset. Hard reset. I said, God, what do you mean a hard reset? I don't know what you mean. God says, if you can only keep two things in the church, I want you to pick them out right now. This is in November 2019. I remember everyone on the team leadership meetings, everyone that showed up, you know. I said, okay, you can only keep two things in your ministry. What are they? Everything else you have to get rid of. What's the two things you can only keep? This is 2019. I'm just trying to help you out keep this right because now it makes sense, right? Now it makes sense. But I remember at the team meeting, people are going, Pastor, what are you going to do? Who are you firing? 
what's going on? I said, I don't know. I just know that God said two things. For me, it came back to two words. You remember, because I talked about this in our annual business meeting, even my vision message on the beginning in January. I said, God said this. He says, we, we're going to go focus on the altar and assimilation, two things. We're going to focus on his presence, and we're going to focus on small groups. I don't know why, but we're going to keep the altars open, and we're going to focus on small groups. Hey, do you remember what happened in 2020? It's a blur, right? Poor Cassie, it's a blur. I'm saying that because God sometimes speaks to us and lets us know ahead of time. Sometimes God's used you to speak to people. We need this voice. We need your voice. But just like the air compressor, there's a tendency that it can blow up in our face. Probably out of all the gifts that I can think of, uh, with, with the ones that are going to be coming up next, this one probably has caused the most struggle and abuse and misuse in the church. What do you do with it? So a lot of people say we don't need it at all. Well, I think that's a big error. I think we're going to miss out. But I think we're also in error if we start laying, laying titles on everybody at the same time. So let me give you some tips. I'm, and what I want to do is this and I take a little extra time this morning, is I'm going to break the practical applications of the gift of prophecy into two categories, using the gift and receiving the gift. How do you use it? What are some practical tips in the body today? And then really, how's, how am I going to personally receive it? So let's break that down really quick. First of all is this. This is really easy. This is, this is going to be the guiding rule for everything, right? Speak the truth in love. Can, you, can I get an amen, right? Amen. All right. Speak the truth in love before anything else. If you can't say it in love, check yourself. Come on now, right? 1 Corinthians 13, 2. There's a reason the love chapter is sandwiched between the two spiritual gift chapters. 13, 2 says this, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. It's vanity. So sure, you can hear things, you can say things, you can do things, but if you don't have love, you're really not doing much. Think on this for a moment. Is what you're going to say going to be redemptive? Is it going to upbuild, encourage, or console the person or the community that you're speaking to? You can tell somebody the truth that their eternal destination is hell. But if it doesn't break your heart in the process, what good is it? Sure, you're speaking the truth, and sure they can hear it, but is it going to help redeem? Is it going to be that moment? And that goes to the next part. Speak the truth in love, and once again, the gift is subject to the user. The gift is subject to the user. In 1 Corinthians 14, 32, it says this, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Can I help you out? We have to understand that God is choosing to express himself through human vessels. How you carry that message has a lot to do with how you are made. You don't have to be creepy. You don't have to be judgmental. You don't have to speak in the King James Version. Come on, right? Do you know how you say, oh, I hope I can say it right. Yeah, here we go. You know how you say, I love you in German? Ich <laughs> You want to say you really love somebody? Ich liebe dich. I love you. That's true. But do you feel it? Right? I mean, what you say is just as important as how you say it, as my mama used to say. There's this part where you got, to, you got to let God use you, and you speak it in a way that's going to be loving, doing to others as you'd have them do unto you, right? Speak in a way that's going to be encouraging, right? Share what you've heard, and then stop. This is a big one. Come on, right? I mean, if you're taking notes today, sometimes you can say, instead of saying, thus saith the Lord, if you do not do your homework, you're going to be grounded, sage, Okay? She does her homework. It's okay. You know, I could say that, but I could say it in another way too. Right? I say, hey, you know, I love you as your dad, and I don't want to see you fall behind your studies. You should get your homework done today. There's a difference there, isn't it? 
How you speak to someone is important. And then you don't have to interpret either. You don't have to go further with it. If God's putting something on your heart and your mind to share with somebody, share it and then stop. Let God give the interpretation. Let someone else be raised up for the, in that gift, right? Let them receive it and work through it. There's, there's this practical part. And I'm telling you, folks, I've been doing this ministry gig for a while. I've been through the charismatic circles and the Pentecostal circles. I've been to all the meetings, right? And I have the T-shirts. And I tell you, this is where we abuse it the most as we add to it. I share an example. I was in, uh, I was moving in prophetic circles for a long time, but I, I went to a conference by Rick Joyner down in uh, Waxahachie, Texas. And all the prophets of the nation were invited to go down there and be part of this. So I was invited to be part of this meeting. We were all filling this stadium, so there was a lot of us. And that season of my life, I was having a lot of questions of what was going on. And I really was doubting this whole process. And I remember saying to God, God, I don't know if I trust this whole process. I don't, I don't know if I trust what's going on here. And then at that moment, they said, okay, I want all you leaders, I want you to come down and form this ring around this, and we have our team, of people that are going to be praying for you, they, and they're going to come and, and pray and give a word to you. I'm like, okay, great, here we go. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> come on. This woman comes from across the stadium. Didn't even hear my mind, didn't read your, my mind, right? She's not psychic, right? Comes up to me and says this. She just looks at me, and she begins to pray, and God, she says this, You've just told God you don't trust him, and he says he doesn't trust you right now. But he wants to change that. And I was like sitting there going, okay. <laughs> you just read my mail. I'll listen to what you have to say, right? And God spoke some challenging things in my own life at that moment that really had to be addressed, right? Not that bad. Don't go there, you know. But, but in that same conference, Rick Joyner said this, and I just thought, if you don't know who Rick Joyner was, he used to be one of the leading prophetic voices in the country, and not AG, it's okay. Um, but he said this, and I thought it was so appropriate, just dealing with the spiritual pride that is so associated with this gift. He says, you touch one cell of the mind of God, and you think you have it all. It was an open rebuke to the, the people. That's the problem we often get. We hear from God and we think we know we can speak for God on every matter. It's like, the, it's like the words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Just because you get a little bit doesn't mean you have it all. He's the source, not you. Can I get an amen? So practically speaking, a couple things. I'm going to move quickly here is this. Don't get scope blind. Scope blind refers to when a hunter is zooming through their sights and they get that one buck focused in their sights and they think they got the buck and they miss the bigger buck that's right off to the side. They lose the awareness of what's going around them. One error that prophets often get when they move in this gift is they get zoned in on a word or a vision, and they miss out on everything else that God is going on around them. So don't get so zoomed in you miss out what God might be saying in the bigger picture, which is the next thing, too, is don't echo the environment. Echoing the environment sometimes called reading the room. It's the gift of prophecy when you get to see what's going on around you and you may know what's going happening and you think that you've got the be all end all on everything. Or you're reflecting what you're hearing everybody else praying around you. If everybody else is struggling with a particular area, you begin to take that burden and you begin to echo that out as a prophetic word. That's not necessarily the right thing to do. Are you, are you tracking with me? Okay. So, and which leads to the next thing. This is a big one too, right? Taking notes today. Avoid intuition and vain imagination. Remember I said earlier, share what you, you, you've heard and that's it. Don't fall into the error of preaching out of your vain imagination or your own intuition thinking you think you know what's going to happen or this is what seems like the right thing to do. Be prayed up. Jeremiah 23, 16 says this. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, fulfilling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. This is a problem that Israel struggled with. There's a lot of false prophets that were speaking things that seemed credible in the mental, in our own reasoning, but they weren't from God. Be careful when you speak a word, if you're going to share a word, you've prayed about it. Come on, I'm, I'm speaking because this is where I'm at. This, if there's a gift that I move in, this is probably the gift I personally move in more. All right? That doesn't mean I own it. I'm not putting that on my business card. Okay? 
But what I am saying is I'm allowing God to say, God, do you want to spirit share something? I need to pray about it. God, what do, you, what do you want to do? How do you want me to say it? What do you need me to do? And then do it. Then take this step of faith to do it. And then here's the big thing. I talked to another pastor friend of mine that moves in, in the prophetic as well. He says, make sure you add this last one. I said, what's that? He goes, understand they, they may have tried hard, but they still may have missed it. Right? Even our good intentions sometimes get us messed up. Right? In fact, if you're going to move in the gift of prophetic, be prepared. You're going to mess up. It's how you learn and hone the skill, believe it or not. You learn a little bit more each time you step out and do it. Right? Someone who says they've never given a wrong prophetic word has only prophesied once. And they got it right the first time. Right? I'm going to challenge you, okay? The good news, though, is that you're in good company. Just like the gift of healing, keep praying, keep seeking, keep speaking. All right, so here we go, really quick. Receiving the gift. What do I do if I, if I hear somebody speak out in the church or somebody comes up to me and gives me a prophetic word, what do I do with this? This is the question I get a lot as a pastor. What Pastor so-and-so came up to me and they shared the prophetic word. What do I do with this word? And I often ask the question, well, what do you think you should do with it? So here's a couple of things. First of all is this, test what you hear. Test it. If it doesn't measure up with the testimony of God and with his word, you can just let it go. It needs to be measured up to God. First John 4, 1 says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Take it to the Bible. If someone says, hey, look, you know, God says you need to go rob a bank. Something silly. Nobody would ever prophesy that, right? You know, God says, God's word says, thou shall not steal, right? So you can say, mm, I'm not feeling that. And that's okay. Test the spirits. It's important, right? Okay? And that goes to the next part. Does your own spirit bear witness? In the case where I shared, where I know what I'd already said in my heart, my mind, and that person came up and shared with me, I knew immediately that I was caught red-handed. My spirit bore witness in that moment. I knew that was what was happening, right? Sometimes you're going to have to take a step of faith and receive it. Maybe you don't even understand it, but at the same time, you'll know in your heart. Let me tell you, can I just be honest with you? Andrea and I, over the years, have received a lot of prophetic words, a lot of well-meaning words, right? Well-intentioned words, and some of them were bunk. Does that mean I shoot the prophet? No, we're not in the Old Testament. Okay? But I have to understand, you don't have to receive it if it doesn't line up with your spirit. Just because they said it. You know, someone can walk up to you and say, you're a poo-poo head. What are you going to do with that? If someone walked up to you and said, you're a poo-poo head, you go, what are you, a child? <laughs> and you would walk away, Right? You wouldn't sit there and go, no, I'm not. You are. You wouldn't get in an argument about it. You wouldn't say, back that up from scriptures. Because they probably could. <laughs> but you know right away. I mean, come on. Some of this is common sense, but sometimes we lose that because we're trying to move in the supernatural, right? But God still wants this gift to move. Please hear this. Does your spirit bear witness? And this is the last one. This is a big one. It's a good thing. Maybe you've had this book. Anybody eaten fried chicken before? Just a few of you? Okay, you've eaten fried chicken? Here's a real pro tip. Pro tip, it's really important if you're eating fried chicken. You eat the chicken and not the bones. Right? Another analogy is simply this. If sometimes you're going to eat a cherry pie and there may be a pit in it. You don't throw away the whole pie. You spit out the pit. Y'all with me? Sometimes, come on now, this, this is a hard one. Sometimes the person sharing means well and doing the best that they can, and they're totally blowing it. Right? This, I'm, 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 I'm debunking this because this impacts all the other spiritual gifts as well. And so we get this mindset that if we're going to move in the gifts, we're going to be like angels. And we're going to be able to speak with this. Right? Y'all with me? Nathan is, that's all I needed. All right. Right? You have that, you hear that, right? 
But sometimes faith is messy. In fact, let me just help you out. Faith is always messy. If it wasn't a mess, you wouldn't need faith. So you step out in it, and that person is meaning, well, you know, and there's, like I said, sometimes we've got some really goofy prophetic words, and usually what it comes down to is, hey, thank you so much that you love me enough that you would share that with me. I'll be honest with you, my spirit does not connect with that, but I'm going to pray about it, and I'm going to test it, do what the scripture says, but thank you so much that you thought about enough to share that with me. It's a lot better than saying, dude, you're off base, get out of my face. I felt like that sometimes, Right? Sometimes I've had people who I don't like, right, come up and give me a word. Hey, pastor, you know what? God really wants to tell you you're being a knucklehead right now. I don't get that one. I'm just making one up. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, who do you think you are? And that's when I really feel like the Holy Spirit checks me and says, ah, son, let's have a talk. Sometimes the messenger messes up. Sometimes the messenger smells, figuratively and literally. And then sometimes it's not for you. But you've got to test it. You've got to try it out. You've got to see if it bears witness in your own heart. And if it doesn't line up, you just say, thank you. I appreciate it, but I'm not going to receive it. I don't, I'm not going to take that. And it's Okay. You're saying, Pastor, I didn't think this stuff was supposed to be that messy. Oh, you haven't been in church very long. It gets messy. But we need the mess. Come on now. Hear me. We need the mess. We need people who are bold enough, who are willing enough to speak to someone who's lost and apart from God. To say, hey, look, you know what? I don't know what you're going through, but God really put you on my heart right now. Can I pray with you? Well, I don't know if you're praying, you know. I got something going on. I got a tree about ready to fall in my house. Pick something crazy. Well, can I pray that that tree doesn't hit your house and that God moves it the other direction, hits your neighbor's house instead? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Fine, whatever. And you pray, and guess what happens? You know what? This is what happens. I'm telling you, the tree's going to move. It, I'm telling you. I've seen it more often than not. But it takes that person of faith that says, I'm, I'm going to pray. But remember, you don't have to be creepy. You don't have to be judgmental. You don't have to be religious. You just have to encourage, upbuild, console. Ask God, how can I use this as a redemptive thing you want to do? Will you join me as we pray? God, I just thank you that you truly do move in and through your church. And Lord, I know we've talked about some of the messy things that happens in church. And Lord, I know that even as I've shared myself, my family, and I know many in the room, we've been hurt by gifts before. Well-meaning people who were thinking they were doing good, and we've got the bad end of it. And Lord, I'm sorry. For, I, I just, my heart hurts for those people as well that have been wounded. And I just pray for healing. Lord, even as we've talked about the gifts of healing today, I pray that there be healing spiritually. Let there be healing emotionally and mentally. Let there be physical healing. God, I believe you can do the miraculous even now. Lord, work your wonders among us once again. There are those who are stuck in a rut and they just need to know that there's a way out. They need some miracles, some intervention in their lives. And God, I pray that you would work your miracles through your people. And Lord, I pray that your voice would arise. Lord, we need your voice in the church. We need your voice to speak in a way that speaks of the love and the redemptive work of Christ, that speaks of conviction and of the coming days, but also leads us into life everlasting. We need your direction and your correction in our lives, oh God. Speak to us, I pray. And Lord, I would just pray that for every person listening today, they would know that they're a vessel that you've chosen to move through. May we be of sensitive hearts and of spirits to simply say, do with me as you will, Lord God. I love you, Lord. I thank you so much for the way you empower your people. And I pray now for your church. I pray the Lord would bless you and keep you. I pray the Lord would make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. I pray that the Lord would watch over you as you would go out and as you would gather back in. And I pray that the Lord would be your strength both now and forevermore. In the name of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, be now blessed in his name. Amen. Amen. Go with the blessings of Christ.